Welcome to this week's episode of The Square, A Curious Conversation. Today we're going to get to talk with Suzanne Tick, and I'm joined with my co-host, Stacey Brimmer, who's an interior designer on the healthcare team. Suzanne, thank you so much for being here with us. It's, I'm excited to be here. Thanks. <laughs> I actually kind of struggled a little bit with how to introduce you because you have done and continue to do so many things. You're an artist, you're a principal with a design studio, you're a meditation teacher, you're a creative director. You you kind of wear a lot of different hats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do. I do. I can't uh, I can't seem to stop. I'm I'm um, this kind of unbounded spirit that just keeps evolving, I think. So then let's talk about where that spirit started. Why, why are you, I mean, of all the things that you do, and you do a lot, why, why design, why be a creative? Is there, is there a point that you knew that was kind of what your life's calling was going to be? Yeah, you know, I think it's, it, I grew up with a family of artists. My grandmother was a portrait painter. My mom was a set designer, and she also was a graphic designer. My dad uh, inherited. He's a third generation uh, recycler at a scrap metal yard in um, Illinois and he was a friend of all the artists in the community so I've always been around artists. I never thought that I would be anything else and so I think that's how it all started. I mean I, I, I remember at a little age of you know three or four you know, playing with clay and and drawing and yeah, it was, it's just, a, it's always been kind of a part of my DNA, so. The junkyard had to give you a, 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 a wide range of materials to work with too. Yeah, I mean the scrap metal, you know, I kind of re realized that, um, you know, they gave me a, a they taught me how to weld really early. You know, this was like uh, <laughs> pre-flash dance, like that kind of thing. But you no, know, <laughs> I was welding in the basement and then got distracted by my brother and his friends. I was kind of putting metal together and dad would always let me go out and find objects and like try to put them together. So um, as a little kid and then I left the, the torch on and went outside for a minute and came back down and <laughs> my parents went crazy. So that was the end of my career as a sculptor. But um, yeah, I think that, that I've always, um, you know, art is such an open-ended um, experience. So, you know, it's, it, you know, becoming a designer is, has allowed me to um, keep that experience alive and keep, being innovative and keep trying something new and not mm -hmm. not kind of being pigeonholed into thinking this is all you know this is this is what we do so I think that brings up a really good point you talk about all the different industries that you're involved in what are some of the industries that you feel like are really pushing that boundary to they're exploring things with the integration of technology or just creative thinking that's different and, and progressive. You know, every, this is, we're all in a, at a tipping point, I think, right now in terms of the environment and sustainability. And so I'm very interested in working with only companies that have that in their um, DNA. And, and that's been a, a really important part for me coming from a family of recyclers. Um, so, well, like right now we're working, um, you know, I've worked with glass for a long time and um, um, we're now working on a, um, a PVC free film that can be applied to glass in a small format, which is really interesting. And so the sustainability comes in terms of the material that, that's being used and also the um, the amount that's being used. And so that's very interesting and the cost is great. Sustainability also comes in the form of cost, I think. And, um, and then on the textile side with Loom, like we've been exploring all kinds of, um, you know, th the qualities of old and new together. So um, 
keeping companies alive in a different way by doing embroidery or using sustainable um, materials. We're working, we've been working for the last two and a half years with um, some um, uh, biodegradable materials. Um, we're in the process of making sure everything passes all the tests that are required and so that we can even market it that way. So it's, it's um, and then the fiber, you know, blending the fibers and dyeing the fibers and making sure everything um, uh, passes all the codes and uh, the environmental codes. Uh, so we're, you know, it's like everything that we're touching and, and um, working on is, um, you know, has that embodiment of sustainability. I think that um, especially with Loom, we don't come out with a lot of products, but we come out with a very, very selected group of products that um, there's so much product in the marketplace. So we're, um, we're motivated by making sure anything that we put in the line is exactly the right, um, the right, the right product for the time is, is really um, our, our, you know, our work with that. And then, you know, with Tarquette, I mean, I started almost 20 years ago. And the reason I went there is because of their, um, their, the technology that they've used with their eco back, you know, their ethos backing, which is unbelievable, was unbelievable to me that, um, you know, the, the liner or the film used in uh, windshields um, was a, a PVB based material and that's what they use and so all of that really excites me and and you know we just keep trying to do um, you know the best job we can um, even with renewable materials like wool and stuff like that that's um, that's something that I, f I don't want to lose track of, of our natural fibers and how important those are. So in that same thread, there's, there's a lot of focus put on um, new technology and innovating, and that's important. But I'm wondering if there should be a renewed focus on transformation versus just innovation. And so, and so thinking about repurposing and reusing. Yeah, well... The way that we approach the transformation of materials is um, in really being original with everything that we do. So we, um, we start on the fiber level um, on the soft surface side and we, we talk to the mills and, and talk about the equipment that they have. And some of their equipment has been sitting, sitting still for years they just haven't you know it's maybe antiquated yarn spinning or uh, air texturizing or something whatever it is and and we are like oh well, what if we took this fiber and we blended it this way or we twisted it this way and so we get into the transformation of the actual fiber um, so we start, you know, with the chemistry of what it is and have that extruded and then whether it's in color form or particulates of metals or whatever it is and, and then we utilize the equipment that they have um, and then we build our own fibers and we transform fabrics um, by taking, this is like the next level, so we have these fibers, is we look at architecture and we look at the skeletal structure of architecture and um, that becomes like a weave draft and that gets drafted um, into our uh, loom downstairs, um, that particular structure um, and that becomes, um, the transformation of an exterior of a building to a fabric that then is used on the interior of a building. So that's been, um, that's one way of transforming material. <laughs> but as an artist, I love doing it. What, so what is it about that that draws you to it? Why do you love that kind of a transformation? Because it's new and it's never been done before and people see things 
like people don't understand why they're attracted to things sometimes. I mean, I find a lot of my my friends and colleagues that they're like, oh, I specified your fabric, or I laid down your I lay down these fabrics and then I turn them over and your name's on them. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm <laughs> delighted to hear that. And they're like, why is it that I like your work? You know, like what is about it? And and I think it's an it's our innate um, desire to. Uh, all of us to transform and evolve and, and move. And because the energy that we put into the development of our products is all about the evolution of change and transformation, I think that that is the embodiment of a lot of the work that we do. And that's what's offered, um, you know, to be specified, I guess, you know. I like it. Um, I'd like to. I'm like kind of a um, non-objective artist, I would say, where it's really the materials that are important, um, so much more important than anything else for me is like the fibers and how it got there and the construction. And then, you know, pattern comes after that. And, and um, but there's all, we're always rooted in architecture because that's where our products go. Um, in, in the interiors of buildings. I think it's amazing the uh, level of thoughtfulness that you use when you approach this stuff. And I can't help but wonder, so when you're thinking about how your products are gonna be used in the architectural built environment, what are the questions you would want designers and architects to ask themselves and kind of encourage our clients to think about whether it's from a sustainable perspective or or just that holistic view that you use when you're developing product? I think the big question is how, how to ask your clients, how would do you want to f your employees to feel in the space? Like what is important about the space. Do you want to energize the space? Um, do you want it to have energy? And how? And then, what materials, as designers, do we build to create more energy in a space? And the energy can come in the form of, you know, high gloss or shiny vertical materials, um, or you know, a combination of matte and shiny textures um, that, that cause a vibration to happen. I mean, it's really a matter of, um, of how, what the energy is. And in terms of sustainability, I think that that's not a question to your clients. I think it's a demand. I, I mean, I think it's more like we, we are going to be, um, sharing the responsibility of sustainability in this space um, we feel strongly about. And you know, you can say it however you want to say it, but, um, but really truly offer materials that um, are sympathetic to the energy of Mother Nature. And um, you know, it's kind of like food, like, like, like over-processed, food is not so good for you. You know, over-processed materials are not so good for you. Like, uh, you know, the single or you know, a few ingredient materials, I think, are, are healthier for all of us. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I look at everything in um, how it feels. Like, does it feel good? Do you feel, does the space feel good? And um, our connection with nature is the, the unifying point for um, for everything, actually. I'm curious. Let's talk a little bit about loom. You mentioned it before. Um, one of those things that I think is important when you're talking with both designers and with clients is fostering that that collaboration and that consensus, um, but also the inspiration. So, how do you, as a creative director, how do you foster that inspiration with your team at Loom? <laughs> oh, I love this. Um, we, I, I have, I have the greatest team ever, actually, um, and everyone has followed my, you know, um, my pursuit of um, kind of opening up their consciousness. So um, we've mm -hmm. all, 
we've all been initiated into our Vedic meditation practice. So that's the first thing is like um, that I offer it. It's not a mandatory thing, but um, to learn how to raise your consciousness um, to a level so that we're all kind of energized and um, equally. And so um, we stop at three o'clock or four o'clock or whenever we can find a time to meditate 20 minutes just to unstress. I mean, it's really, really, really important to unstress. And um, that's one thing. I mean, and it's, it's a really critical piece of um, everyone's growth actually, but um, for being a creative um, in this industry or any industry, um, getting, uh, you know, blocking stress from your body and unstressing your body really allows you to have much more clarity to detail and um, the fine level of tactility of feeling and seeing and um, so what, we have charrettes that are so special um, and we try to keep these charrettes going on a regular basis where um, we um, pull together everything that we're seeing and hearing um, and, and you know and um, we, we get together and we talk about and show images and um, talk about, not just in our industry, but in all industries and in, um, in the, the, the art world and in galleries. And so we're constantly evolving and um, that comes down to the fine level of, of naming things. It's so important. We spend a lot of time thinking about how these products look and how they should be named, the color names. It's extremely time consuming, but it's so important um, that everything feels just right, you know? Um, and so our charrettes evolve from, you know, one thing into another and we're not, I'm not really um, bound to like, this is how we're gonna do a charrette, it's like, we pull charrettes together once and you know we definitely do them every quarter to kind of build out you know the plan for the following year but you know i was just reading an interesting article and i'm like let's have a charrette next week i think we need to talk about this and at, at different times if we're getting into a major kind of color rush of something, um, not rush as in we're in a rush, as in rush, it's like, oh my God, this is gonna be yeah. amazing. <laughs> um, then, um, you know, we talk about where, you know, intrinsically, what does the world need right now? What is relevant for the time? And, um, and that's how we, we determine um, what goes in and how it gets colored and what the collections need, how, you know, how Loom needs to evolve because we don't, we're not putting in as many products as our entire competition. We don't put in very many products, but the ones we put in evolve our line and kind of are, um, we feel very relevant for the time. Mm. It's nice not to not have to feel like you have to pump a lot of product to keep that something, you know, whether it's uh, real or not real going, you know, it's, it's, yeah. mm -hmm. there's enough is enough in a way, you know, and there's right. enough already. <laughs> so it's really, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't even know how you all make your decisions on things. It's like, right. <laughs> So many products and you see so many people, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that I liked that you said was that how you use charrettes as a reaction to things that are going on in the world right now. And we can't, we can't ignore the pandemic and what's happening around us. And I think in some ways it has really highlighted how important, uh, touch tactility is because we can't do it as much anymore so when when you're thinking about how this affects your profession in particular and and the world in general 
what are your thoughts about how this is going to change that that whole sense of tactility? Well, you know, there's been a tons of pandemics in this world over the ages, <laughs> forever and ever and ever. Um, but you know, from an early age, when we were when we were born, or if we are gifted with the ability to have children and be around children, um, the softness of things and the cuddliness of materials and um, the um, the sound of nurturing sounds and tastes and things um, are innate in us. So, you know, we're constantly looking, you know, tactility is, is all the senses, you know, and, you know, we have five of them and we have to make sure that how it feels to the skin and how it feels to our sight, um, you know, and how it smells, everything um, needs to be, feel good. You know, there's nothing worse than opening a package and you, you like, there's off-gassing. I'm like, oh my God, like, get that out of the office. There's something in there, you know. <laughs> so, um, you know, so we make sure that, um, you know, like it, like as a baby doesn't want to have harsh things around it, whether it's a chemical, you know, topical treatments or no-nos, you know, or, um, you know, the fibers twisted too hard, you know, lessen the fiber. Visual tactility is equally as important. So, you know, creating that visual tactility and, you know, as well as touch, it's all, you know, we have the ability to um, make that happen, and it's the fibers that we use and the colors that we use um, that can help gain in the tactility um, aspect of it. I'm, I'm kind of curious because it, I have a two and a six-year-old, and like up until January, it was like, hey, you really have to watch their screen time, and you know, screens are a bad thing. And then now with remote learning, it's pretty much all they do is being on the iPad and learning and and I as I was reading some of the articles you had written it kind of struck me how sterile smooth glass kind of is and it's something that we interact with all the time I mean every day usually every minute of every day because we're on our phones and we're doing a bunch of different things has that made having something that is textured that much more important whether it's soft or you know rugged is it is being able to have that connection with something that has a texture more important now? Absolutely. I think, I think it's all about, it's all about texture. I mean, look outside. I mean, take our cues from nature. You know, there's just, you know, there's a vast ocean out there of, of flatness and then the waves, <laughs> start bringing texture in and then a big storm comes and a lot of texture and the same thing in the forest you're surrounded by texture I think we're all craving texture because of the flatness of the screens and you know because our kids are um are I just like watch this too because our kids are so you know, embedded now on these flat screens, like just make sure you go out for a walk at the end of the day or start your day and say, let's go walk around the block or something. And so that their, so that their vision gets expanded and, and, and then afterwards, you know, after the day, you know, go for a walk outside to the playground, even if you're too exhausted to even do it, just go because you know how your eyes are feeling. I know my eyes are feeling. It's like, it's like my, my vision is either like this much or this much, you know? And so the, um, you know, we have to use what we have to, um, expand every, we have to think about when we're contracting all the time expansion, we have to balance it with expansion. So, 
you have to go outside, you have to look at the sky, you have to look at the trees. All of that stuff is really, really critical for kids. Um, take a walk, you know, even if you're in the city, look at the top of the buildings, like just like, you know, explore all of that. Um, but tactility is, yes, m much more important than ever, ever uh, before, you know. In the same way that there's a variety of textures, there's a variety of colors, there's a variety of, of fabrics and materials to work with. And, you know, certainly at Loom and at the design studio and, and the various other things you're involved with, how do you pull all of those together and have it be something special and unique? Hmm. So sometimes there's happy accidents, actually, that, um, <laughs> you know, Every, all of the products and materials that we're working on, whether it's textiles, uh, glass, or carpet, they all have their own cycle of introduction and stuff like that. And, and sometimes one pattern can um, translate beautifully in another product. Like we've done drapery uh, before and then taken that pattern and put it on glass. And, and then that marriage is really, really um, kind of unique and beautiful. Um, so we, you know, it's not an intentional thing, but um, unless we are taking pattern to pattern to, you know, from one, one subject matter to the other in terms of material. But, um, but it's more that the tactility of, of our materials um, relate because we're always balancing you know, from the, the pattern element, um, you know, technology and, and the look of technology with architecture and, the, and um, the relevance of that structural study and we're balancing those all together and then you add the, the fiber on it and then it becomes this very interesting melange of, you know, um, tactility and pattern all together. And then if you use the fabric that um, was inspired at uh, one time um, with the carpet, you can see the connection between the two. And it's, mm -hmm. it's really, you know, a lot of it's not a conscious effort. It's more unconscious. Um, but because it's all derived from the way that we build things, um, there's a connection. So I have, you know, I've, I've, I have... Um, you know, been told that, you know, the entire project has, uh, you know, tick product in it, you know, that all relates and were they developed at the same time and some of them would be three or four years apart. And, but because mm. it's our genre of kind of the way we de design things, everything seems to work together. So, so one, one of the things that I know people will immediately think of when I think they hear your name is weaving and I I love how you have put such an emphasis on hand weaving I, I am curious though I mean with so many different products and and um, fabrics and, and various things being made with manufacturing so not using hand woven techniques why why is it important that that we do that stuff by hand oh the hand whether it's drawing or weaving it, it just allows um, expl more exploration and the more exploration um, the better it is listen I have found over the years and you know I've been in the industry for almost 40 years I think like this year would have been my 35th neocon or something like that but <laughs> um, the more you touch the project or the product for us the more you touch it the more engaged you are from start to finish um, the more nurturing you know it goes for life everything you know the more um, you're around it and can help it and adjust it and move it the the longer the lifespan um, the more caring it, um, so for me uh, you know um, I still <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I, I miss the whole computer stuff. Um, so I like drafting on graph paper, you know, like, or, mm -hmm. you know, little line drawings or whatever, or Xeroxing and cutting and pasting and stuff like that. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like old school, but, um, 
but then it's not like you can try so many different things then you know when we when we look at our weavings um, that hand weavings that we're developing with different fibers and different we toss all different things in it and you know it allows for expansion again it's not just you know looking shopping for something styling it you know like oh i want to buy that from this you know you know sometimes that's how it works in the textile industry where the mills all have their own designers and their own collections that they share and then you pick something and stuff like that and for us it's more like what does our collection need and how can we go back from the beginning and start from scratch with hand weaving i love it i mean i don't know I wouldn't feel like I was doing um, my clients a service unless I was really handling the product from start to finish to, to you know, out the door. Like, we're involved with all of it, you know, the marketing side of it and how, it's na you know, of course, the naming is so important, but, yeah. I like to consider myself, a, a, instead of a maniac, um, micromanager which I've been called before from some of my staff members <laughs> <laughs> to a loving controller now <laughs> a loving controller <laughs> I think one of the things that I love about what you just said is sometimes when everything's in a computer you're expected to iterate super quickly and you've got to turn out all of these different options and the the beauty of doing things by hand is that it forces you to slow down a little bit and think about the decisions that you're making instead mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. you know, just sort of throwing them out there because the computer. I love what you're saying, Stacy, because that's what I love about watching my team work on the computer. I'm like, can you put that in like three repeats across and three repeats down, and let's just make sure that this pattern doesn't have some kind of weird lineup. And then they're like, oh sure, and they're like, Dee -dee 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 -dee. and I'd be like. <gasps> <laughs> I want to learn how to do this. How do you do this so quickly? So the computer is there for like great reasons, you know, for those kinds of adjustments and things like that, that you, then you can fix and you can like pigeonhole where the problem is in, in the pattern or whatever. Um, but I like us taking our time with, um, with the development from, you know, from scratch and looking at the fibers. I mean, we have so much fun. I mean, I think we have fun. I, I hope everybody knows. <laughs> <laughs> because it's so unusual. Everything we're doing is so different from another product, you know? Um, yeah. and, and it's a different time, you know? To be relevant, things change and you need to change. And the relevance of what's, what we want to do now is different from what we wanted to do before. So tell me a little bit about, speaking of weaving, the, the piece that you did that, although you didn't realize it at the time, ended up in the Bill and Melinda Gates offices. Like, I mean, I'm just flabbergasted with how you even came up with that concept. So th the story about the Gates piece was, and I actually didn't know it was the Gates piece for a good long while um, until, you know, after I, the proposal was made. Um, that came about because um, my father came, was diagnosed, you know, with like th three, three months to live. And I was like, there is no way there's more life in this man. I know it. And so I flew him from Illinois to um, New York and brought him to, to the, the doctors. And, um, and while he was there, I wanted to weave something for him. So I really believe that when... You know, when the desire to, or from the Vedic worldview, when the charm comes to do something, follow your charm. And I was like working, working full time. And then I'm like, I want to weave something for my dad. I'm so tired, but I want to weave something for my dad. And I want it to be metal because it has to do with um, my father because he, you know, is a scrap metal dealer. And so I'm like, what do I have in the house that's metal? What, what recycled material? What can I use? And then I was like, I have a whole bag of dry cleaning hangers that I can take back to the dry cleaner, but I'm going to cut them up and weave them. And so, I, you know, it was a gift for my father. And then, you know, 
I, you know, around the end of the year, I try to come up with some weaving projects and that I could send to friends or architects that have come to the studio that we were blessed to have their company and stuff like that. So I wove a bunch of these little samples of the metal um, wire hangers and uh, one of uh, a design director from the firm that was working on the Gates Foundation called and said like, wow, how much is this a square foot, you know? And I was like, no, 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 this is, <laughs> this is my first foray into hand weaving in my own art, you know, just to play and not make something for the industry. And so, um, and I explained that to them and they were like, well, will you look at an elevation? Tell us like what that would mean if you were gonna make something for this elevation. And so, I had been weaving these strips of it for my dad, you know, and so I started counting how many hangers it would be, and I was like, whoa, boy, this is like gonna be 5,000 hangers. This is a big project, you know, and so <laughs> my bookkeeper was like, this would be a big project. You have to charge for this, you know, like, because I'm like, oh, we could That's do this. That's a lot this. of dry cleaning. Oh, <laughs> you know, and so, um, any, anyway, so I just followed charm and that's what it, I had no idea what I was like getting myself into, but it's great. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really the tra it, transformation of that material, sorry. Was it something that was um, almost cathartic because of what you were going through? You know, I was so excited about um, the fact that I could weave and it was so different. It wasn't about um, commerce. So um, yeah, like that, you know, the transformation for me on that was that um, it gave me the ability, I'm so happy when I'm weaving because I don't have to um, I can just be by myself. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. you know, and it, and so it, it just made me so happy that I could, I could weave. I could just sit and weave and weave and any weaver out there knows exactly what <laughs> that means. But, um, yeah, it was a, it's a great feeling. A big project like that is like the big strands, you know, I'd weave and weave and then I'd get to the, to the end because I had to measure it all. And then, I, you know, I'd have to cut these sections off because they were so heavy, I couldn't lift them, <laughs> you know? So it was yeah. like, I realized, you know, and you learn every time you do something new. I mean, I don't, I'm surprised every day about, you know, the materiality of things. So it's always, yeah. it's an ever uplifting experience. So you've mentioned a couple of times today about the importance of opening your conscience up and your whole team kind of getting involved in Vedic meditation. I know personally I follow you on Instagram, so I see, I see it out there. Um, and I think my question for you comes down to you, in, in the world today, it feels like we're really asked to express who we are as an individual way out there for everyone to see. Uh, and spirituality is a very personal thing. How do you find that balance um, between having that spirituality out there and being, it's not really part of your business, but it's such a part of you that it mm -hmm. is? Um, how did you find that? Well, when I first got into meditation, um, I tried a lot of different types of meditation and I really, I didn't think I was like a meditator until um, I found this type of meditation. And, um, you know, you find your teacher and that teacher, like that's when you realize it. And so, um, when I went to, and then I, you know, I st started studying with Tom Knowles and, and, um, and, you know, after three and a half years, I've, I'd taken all of his courses, extensive courses, and, um, and then, there, you know, it's like, well, you should come to 
India for three months and do this training, and I'm like, oh no, 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 I'm like, like, I'm in this industry, and I don't think I can do that, you know, like, um, and so, um, what happened when I went to India is that, um, and it was a hard, that was a co complex, hard course, hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, and it, I realized when I completed that, that, you know, you know, all along I've always shared my knowledge of how you make things. You know, we, all, we have always had interns. I explain everything, how, how you do what we do. You know, I'm always teaching weaving classes, weaving workshops and all of that. And I've always wanted to share knowledge. You know, hoarding knowledge is like the worst thing. It's like giving knowledge out is really, really important. And because there was an element in me about four years ago where I couldn't figure out why I had accomplished so much, but I couldn't find that happiness. Um, and why, why, why can't I, why, what is happiness anyway? You know, like, why can't, yeah, okay. where does it come from? Like, why am I so, like, up all night? I can't sleep, and I'm worried about this, or I make up that they're mad at me, or whatever. All of those crazy things that one does when you're, overworked and you can't relax and all of that and then I started this practice and then I went to India and then it became very very clear to me that I want to share this knowledge that is so profound and so helpful um, you know for all of us you know and so Sunday mornings get on my meditation <laughs> practice <laughs> um, I'll teach you how you know I mean it's a four-day course eventually you need to do that but um, it's something that is, will change your life. And I'll tell you, if 1% of this world meditated, we'd have a whole different consciousness in, in our society. And, you know, that's what I'm here to do, whether it's weaving workshops or meditation practice, is to guide people to find um, where their happiness is. And we all have so much creative energy inside of us um, but it's very much clouded by fear and, and anxiety, and that doesn't need to be there. And you can, there's a way to get rid of it. So I, that's why I did well, it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, Suzanne. And Stacy, thank you for being here. If you want to learn more about Suzanne Tick and all the many hats that she wears, um, make sure to check out the description below. We'll have links to her sites to learn more about meditation, as well as a link to her TED Talk, which was fascinating. Thanks for joining us this week on The Square, A Curious Conversation With.